We're glad you're here. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Hope you enjoy the service and the worship, the singing, the teaching, and the fellowship. We'd like to read some scripture to you to open up our service. It's found in Deuteronomy 32, the first four verses. Listen, O heavens, and I will speak. Hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my teaching fall like rain, and my words descend like dew. The showers on new grass, like abundant rain on tender plants. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O oh, praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. What a description of our holy God. And that's who we come to worship this morning. He is worthy of our praise. We're here to give him glory. Before we pray, I'd like to uh, let you know that the prayer missionary family at this time are Ernest and Effie Dick. They have served for many years in Venezuela. And if you have any sense of what's going on in the world, Venezuela is probably not the place you're going to go on vacation because it's an absolute mess. People are starving. They lack medication. They lack help. It's a total dictatorship. So the decks were forced out three or four years ago. And their mission has had them going to different countries that have Spanish-speaking people. And so they are based here in the States, but they minister wherever they're sent. So we want to pray for them. Now, it's Bill bawled me out for not praying for the prayer family of the month, which happens to be Jane and me. And so you get to pray for us. We are grateful to be a part of this church. Um, you can pray for our family. We have four grown sons, and they've multiplied to become 14 grandchildren, which we love and enjoy. They all know the Lord, which is God's mercy and entirely his grace. Um, we enjoy our involvement here at church. Jane ministers to two ladies in our neighborhood, and she probably wouldn't mind me to tell you this, but our small group knows. And they're both unbelievers, and they're both well into their 80s. And we're praying for their salvation. So when you think of us, think of those two ladies that they would come to know to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the word of God. It abides forever. It's unchanging. We don't have any right to add to it or take away from it. It is the eternal word of God. We thank you that every jot and every tittle will be fulfilled. Not one word will drop because you are the mighty God. We thank you for our salvation, that you have given us eternal life because of your grace and mercy. Help us to walk worthy of our calling. We pray for Ernest and Effie, who are in a challenging place in life. They're not youngsters anymore, and they had their ministry sort of taken away when they had to leave Venezuela. But you know that, and you know that they're able to minister and serve elsewhere, and we pray for them. I thank you for my wife, Jane, and for our family. And Lord, I just pray that every day we would give you honor and glory in how we live. Bless our time as we worship and have our hearts focused on you. Guide Bill as he teaches from your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Would you guys stand with me this morning as we get started with some, some songs of praise and worship? How lovely is your dwelling place, O oh Lord Almighty, for my soul longs and even faints for you, for here my heart is 
lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, praise the one who set me free, hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me, you have broken every chain, this salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living So now you guys are dismissed to a time of fellowship. Uh, take this time to greet somebody next to you, refill your coffee. Uh, we'll be back here for the message in about five minutes. As you're, as you're turning uh, or you're talking and sitting, please turn to Romans chapter 12. And, um, you know, I just, I say as humbly as I can, I just hate to draw attention to myself. But don't I look good today? Okay, okay, I know, I know, and you're thinking you always do. No, no, um, so, so I bring that up because uh, Noah, our, our worship leader, Noah, Noah up here, he just, he's just been here um, doing this role for three years, and uh, just over three years, and if you know his story, you know, the first time he, he asked to step up and serve when there was a need in this ministry, he had actually never even sung in front of people or in front of a mic. And then just to see how the Lord has grown his, not just his ability musically, but just his heart for the church, his heart for the Lord and this area of service. Um, it's just a, an honor to be serving alongside him and, and hit the worship team, which is, includes about 25 people total or more in our church body. But that being said, Noah has just yesterday um, had, he's going to barbering school and um, he had to take his state board exams yesterday. And so I got to be his uh, model, his mannequin. And so, so that's why I bring that up. Noah, um, he did a great job. And it was the first time I've ever had a hot towel straight razor shave. And I'm telling you, I'm going to adjust my budget and put that into my pampering scheme, which um, normally is not much of a scheme at all. It's uh, an inch and a half razor that goes over my head. But anyhow, uh, he did a great job. He passed, and um, it, was, it was a good time. So good job, Noah. Congratulations. Congratulations on that. And, uh, and so I probably could say more, but I won't. <laughs> Um, actually, I will say one thing. Right after he got done shaving me, he turned around to throw the towels in, and he opened up the lid, and there was a bunch of people testing. One of the towels, it was like, it looked like a horror scene. There was blood all over the place. And so we're like, oh, boy, someone didn't pass. <laughs> and I'm like going, am I okay? Am I right? Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm okay. So, no, he did an awesome job. As a matter of fact, the rest of the, the people in the class were turning to him 
looking for um, advice. It was pretty awesome to see him, you know, in that way. So in any case, um, Romans chapter 12, perfect segue. (laughs) Romans chapter 12. Uh, We are in week 40 of this series through the book of Romans. We've chosen to work through the book of Romans as as a church primarily because we want a, a strong focus on discipleship. It's important uh, that as we live out our Christian faith, we recognize the truths that undergird that faith. And so with that, here we are. We look at the book of Romans. Some would say that if you only had one book of the Bible to be stuck on a desert island with, it would be the book of Romans because you see the whole scope of of God's redemptive plan from 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 the beginning through eternity. And, and so with that being said, we've broken this up into two sections. And so if you're new with us, um, this will be new information, but give you a quick recap. Chapters 1 through 11 of Romans ultimately houses what we would call the essential truths or maybe we would say orthodoxy, the doctrines of our faith. What makes the Christian faith the Christian faith? Really what it makes... The Christian faith, the Christian faith is the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so with that, with that story of the gospel of Jesus Christ, many people who've grown up in church think that the gospel message, the good news, is is just how someone comes to faith in Jesus. You accept the finished work of Jesus Christ. Um, he, He forgives you your sin, and now you're a Christian. But what we're focusing on here and what the book of Romans focuses on is that the gospel is so much bigger than just this entry point into the Christian life. The gospel is the Christian life. And we get to see all of the components of what makes the gospel of Jesus Christ the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it sums it up pretty well um, in a lot of different ways, and we've covered those. They're all 39 or 35 or so of those messages are are there for the the listening to. We're not going to cover all that, but that's the first 11 chapters. And then there's a pivot point in chapter 12 when it goes from the the teaching of truth, this is what the gospel is, to this is what the gospel looks like. This is the way um, we are human beings, not human doings. We are not just religious robots. Um, We're just very spiritual beings. No, we actually, as followers of Christ who have received the gospel of God through his son, Jesus Christ, and walk by faith, this is the expression of it, and this is what it should look like in chapters 12 through 16. So that's where we're at. And in order to launch that, he gives us verses 1 and 2. Really, um, this is the summation in, in, in a sentence or two, the Christian life. What, if you want to know what the Christian life is... Um, What the Christian life is is found right here in in, in verse 1 and 2. It says, I appeal to you, therefore. Now that therefore is referring back to those last 11 chapters. Because you've gotten this boatload of truth, this teaching about who God is, who Jesus is, why this matters, because of that, therefore, I urge you, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God to present your bodies as living sacrifices. This was an important picture in that day because they were used to a sacrificial system, but sacrifices were dead. People that follow Christ physically aren't actually dead. They're living. And so we're to be living sacrifices. These living sacrifices is what is our acceptable form of worship unto the Lord. And so with that being said... Someone's car alarm's going off in the, in the parking lot, so not sure who that is. But uh, with that all being said, we've got this picture. This is what the Christian life is, being a living sacrifice. Um, and then how do you walk in that? The first thing that Paul, through the Holy Spirit, says is you are to renew your mind, that our minds are to be renewed. And that, that picture of renewal is a continual renewal. It's not a let's renew our mind on Sundays. Let's not renew our mind um, every time we, we um, go through some help, self-help class. No, we actually are in the continual process of daily, moment by moment, renewing our minds in what? In the gospel. We renew our minds in the truth of the gospel. We renew our minds in the fact that without Christ, 
we are nothing. I mean, we might be something in this world, but in relation to God's design, without faith in Christ, we are helpless. We cannot save ourselves in any way, shape, or form. And so we renew our mind to this this beautiful truth that despite my rebellion against God, which is simply original sin, the fact that we're all born into sin, despite this, God loved me and he came for me. And despite all of those things, I have now received by faith the son Jesus. I was talking to one of you a number of months ago and and you came up to me after the service and, and you said to me something that was just makes me get the goosebumps and makes my eyes tear up. You said, um, in light of what we just said, he goes, I just don't think I have enough faith um, to believe in God, nor do I think there's enough forgiveness for me. And the reason why that just so much emulates with this picture of the gospel is that's absolutely right. None of us has enough faith. None of us can will ourselves enough forgiveness. It's all because of Jesus. In light of the fact that Christ has come, he has lived the perfect life that we were called to live, and he has died a horrific death that really is the punishment for our sins. And so, yes, there isn't maybe in my mind enough forgiveness for me in what I've done in my life. Um, And maybe it doesn't seem like I have enough faith, and I don't have enough faith, but God does through his son Christ, and I can trust that. I believe that. I believe that God sent his son as a way, as a propitiation, as an atonement for my sin. That's the gospel message. And in light of that, I live sacrificially. There's no other logical means. All right, so that's the first part of the review of chapters 1 through 11 and 12, 1. Then last week, we got to chapter 12, verse 3 through 8. And I want to just be honest with you, this is a moment of vulnerability for me personally. I really struggle with even going on to verse 9 today. One, because I know not everybody was here last week to hear um, the importance of of verses 3 through 8. But more importantly, those of us who actually were here last week, I'm not convinced that we took it seriously. Verses 3 through 8. And so I just kind of, in some senses, want to just pull out the slim notes because I thought it was a great sermon. Um, But uh, no, I just, I want to pull out that truth and remind us of what was said there. And and this is the point of last week. The point is last week that if, if this is your church, and if it's not, if you're visiting and you have another church, this would apply in that context. But if you were a follower of Jesus, if you have accepted by faith the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have a part in the family of God. You specifically have been given a gift or gifts by God that is meant specifically to build God's kingdom and specifically build his church right here and extend the the church beyond these walls into this community and into the rest of the world. That is your response. It's not my responsibility or your elder's responsibility It's your responsibility to know what your gift is and to find as many different ways to practice that gift. If you don't know what that is, you don't really know the Christian life because there's nothing more great, more beautiful um, in the Christian life than to be able to help others grow in the Christian life. And you and I can't do that in our own strength. We do that through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit who is given a gift to each according to the grace which God has given And so this concept of hierarchy in churchiosity is not biblical. We are the church body. And if you don't specifically know what your part of that is, if you don't know if you are the head, the heart, the finger, the arm, the muscle, the knee, the rump, if you don't know what that is, how are you going to serve and are you serving? Because it's not just for a few. It's for all of us because... According to Scripture, according to Romans 3, that we all have been given the same standard of faith, and that standard of faith is Jesus Christ. There's not one person that's more righteous in this room than somebody else. They might look it on the surface, but they're not in reality. In reality, 
for those of us who have trusted Christ, when God looks upon us, he looks upon us and he sees Jesus. He doesn't see our abilities. And so therefore, you have a job to do. You have a part in this family. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. So many of us don't. That's what last week was about. There's lots of ways to kind of discover that. And it's not a science. It's an art. It's a beautiful thing. And we have lots of different, like, tools to, to help people discover what their gifts are. But then you got to walk in it. you got to live it out. you got to practice it. And the reality is it doesn't just, the thing about a spiritual gift that's so great is it's not just a Sunday thing. I mean, God gave you a gift in order for you to be a part of and to work in the body of Christ, and that does get expressed in ministry senses here. But if you know what your gift is and you're exercising it and it's growing, then it functions specifically in your marriage, it functions in your workplace, it functions in the church, it functions in your own head, it functions in your day-to-day life all of the time. And so what is your gift? Do you know what it is? And are you exercising it? Are you, none of us are good at it all the time. We fail forward. That's kind of what we do. It's okay. We're a place of grace. But the idea that the church, and it's, it's led by just a few, that's the picture of the stomach of Christ. That's what we talked about last week. God never, and his writers, never talk about the stomach of Christ, a place where I just come and get fed. It's always the body of Christ. And if part of the body is sick, it affects the whole. What's your gift? Do you know what it is? Now, I say that with a full understanding that everything I say in verses 9 and 10, we're just covering two verses, and I'm doing that in essence because I, I think it would be a tragedy for you and for me and for our, our purposes for God's kingdom to just plow forward without thinking there's some tie to this from the concept of our gifts being operated. Because in the next nine through the end of this chapter, there's 27 characteristics of love. There's 27 different ways that love is described, but it's not an accident that Romans 12 has the summation of the Christian life. Romans 12, 2 talks about the renewal of that gospel message to ourselves and to the world every day. And then he goes right to the spiritual gifts. And right after he says how essential every one of our gifts are, he then says this, verses 9 through 13. In light of the spiritual gifts, in light of what you know to be true about the gospel, let your love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. As we're talking about them, we're just going to talk about three characteristics of, of love today that we see here. Don't let that concept and the context of spiritual gifts lead your heart and mind. Relating to love, I'm fearful talking about love because it's such a watered-down concept today, but that's probably why Paul gives us 27 different adjectives to describe it here in these following verses. But Jesus said that love, love is the singular defining characteristic of um, how others will view him, view his church. He said specifically, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love. Not the world, not your spouse, although it's part, love one another. The way in which we here in this room in the chapel, even the first service folks, the way that we interact, the way that we treat each other is the essence of how the world around us, our neighbors, will perceive the gospel. And more specifically, they will know us by our love for one another. Very serious, very serious charge for us. And so with that charge, 
it says, let your love be genuine. Let your love be genuine. That word genuine, and number, number one here, I have to kind of put the ones, twos, and threes, but love, love should be without hypocrisy. That word genuine literally means hypocrisy. Let there be no hypocrisy. And we just came from one of our membership classes. I love membership classes because there's 19 of us in there and getting to hear most all of the testimonies. We ran out of time. Um, but just to hear the, the beautiful backgrounds of people with lots of, in some senses, history, lots of pain, a lot of redemption, a lot of hope, lots of triumph. And I know in just someone sharing a, a minute or two of their story and they're talking about the brokenness in marriages or with family, um, hurts and abuses in previous churches, um, and yet um, because of the grace of God and because of the redemption found and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, they're here, they're choosing to be involved, they're choosing to engage. Uh, that's beautiful. Um, but we all have them and we all know people have them, those that have been turned off by phony love that they've seen expressed in church life, where someone looks very nice or very warm or things look good um, the first time we visit a church or the first time we, we, we are interacting with someone and we find out they're a Christian and maybe they're very helpful, maybe they're very polite, maybe they're very warm. But then underneath, we find with some more time, underneath that veneer um, is, is a darkness or a heart that is bitter or a heart that is angry. And this can be of a person or it can be of a whole culture of people, um, um, of, of bitterness, gossip, anger, the hatred even. This can be something that is somewhat seen underneath. But Paul says, love as we know it from the gospel, it must not be that way. It must not be hypocritical. It must be through and through. Jesus was most critical of the surfacy, shiny religious people. He would call them whitewashed tombs. You know, look at it on the outside, but really they're just a cavern for death. So be careful, he would say. Don't be like these whitewashed tombs. And a good example of this you know, was I met a guy at Elk Camp a number of years ago, and as we were there, he was sitting around the campfire and he was sharing about his roommate. And um, he thought the roommate relationship was just fine. And the roommate had to move out, and so the roommate moved out. And after the roommate moved out, um, he didn't have a replacement yet, and so he just lived his life. But it was a few days later, he kind of started to smell something coming from that room, and he wasn't quite sure what was going on. And so he went in there, and he's like, yeah, it's kind of, you know, funky smell. And so he does what he normally does after a new roommate comes in. He shampoos the carpet and paints the walls, and it didn't work didn't work. And as, it, as he was kind of going through the process of, of cleaning this room out, it was another couple days later, and he came in, and his dog had got into the room while he was at work, and the dog had chewed a hole in the carpet. And the room now really stunk, and he was like, what is going on? So he put some air fresheners in there. Didn't do a thing. Finally, after another few days, um, he climbed under the house, and he saw underneath the house were a whole bunch of salmon carcasses. Well, this roommate, apparently, who left in good standing, wasn't so happy with him for whatever reason. And so his, his, his love gift goodbye was to throw these salmon carcasses underneath the house. To one final, I got you, I guess. I mean, I, I got to admit, that's a good one. I mean, if you really want to get somebody, that, that is a good one. Um, not Jesus-y, but that is definitely, that's definitely a good one. But think about it like this. How much of the love that goes on um, in the world today um, is a love like that where the veneer of it looks okay, but, but underneath the surface, it is false. Underneath the surface, it is, it is a rotten salmon carcass. It can be hidden by paint for only so long. It can be hidden by air fresheners for only so long. There's only so much we can do for um, hiding that, but eventually it's going to smell through. It's going to come through. And, and so that is what, that's what love with hypocrisy looks like. Love with hypocrisy um, is, is love where there is a dead salmon on the inside, where there's something rotting under the surface of things. And Paul is saying our love as followers of Jesus is to be different than that. Our love is to be through and through. Our love is to be all the way down. That's what our love is to look like. And it's an easy thing to say, 
isn't it? Okay, good, good sermon. Easy thing to say. We got to really be good lovers all the way through, all the way down. But what about that person? What about that one person in your life that is difficult to love? And I told first service the same thing I'll tell you. If you don't know of that one person in your life that's difficult to love, then you can just say, well, you're looking at him. Um, I'll be that one person. But I'm guessing that all of us have one person, at least one person, that, that is in our life that is difficult to love. What do we do about that person? How do we love genuinely the person or the people or the people group or the political party uh, or, or the crusade group that, how do we love genuinely someone that maybe makes my life miserable physically, emotionally, in reality? How do we love that person? Can, is, does Paul say we're to genuinely love those people? I can genuinely love Anna because Anna's wonderful or even Josh or Steph. Um, it's easy to love people that are lovable, but what about those that aren't unlovable in our lives? How do we, does this, does the gospel apply to those folks? Would my spouse, when my spouse is being, not my spouse, maybe your spouse, you get it. <laughs> how do we, when my children are, how, how do we do that? What is the picture there? How, how, do, how, how are we to, I don't even know where my wife is. Are you in here, honey? Oh, hi, sweet face. Hi, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, Okay. I know that look. I know that look. <laughs> How do we love that way? How can we love without hypocrisy when someone's absolutely gifted at annoying us? That as absolutely and maybe even unintentionally hurting us. How do we love without hypocrisy? How do we show that kind of love in a situation, in a scenario like that? Well, guess what? The gospel tells us how, and Jesus has been very clear and very specific. And um, I trust here, I'm going to read a passage that's a little bit of a, a, a mouthful, but it's such a beautiful story. It's not going to be unfamiliar to all of you. Please stay attention to the spirit of the story as I, as I read. I wish I could just tell it better than I can, but I want to read it because Jesus gets to the heart of, of this question of what about that person? that is so hard for me to love. Matthew 18, verse 21, and, and you can turn, read along, you can just listen. It says this, then Peter comes to Jesus, and, and, and Peter asks of Jesus the same question we've all asked of that person. How many times do I have to forgive this person? I mean, am I just enabling them at this point? I continue to forgive them, and I continue to try to show grace, and nothing changes. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or my sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And then Jesus, who, as he always does, raises the bar and he says, I tell you, not seven times, but infinity. Seventy times seven. There is no end to your forgiveness for them. And then he tells the story. And this is the beauty of our Savior as he speaks. He says, Therefore, there's a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, and it is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with all of his servants. And as he began to settle these accounts, um, there was a man, a servant of his, who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. And he brought this man who owed him all this. That's virtually um, a debt that could never, it's like a zillion dollars in the Greek. And so there was that big, huge debt. And he was not able to pay it. So the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, that servant falls on his knees before him. And he says, be patient with me. He begged him. He said, I will pay back everything. Well, the servant's master takes pity on him. Not only did he give him a stay, but he, he canceled the debt. He removed the debt, and he let the guy go. Verse 28, it goes on to say, But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a silver, uh, a silver coin or silver coins, which is just nothing, very little. And then he grabbed this other servant who owed him virtually nothing, and he began to choke him. He says, Pay back to me what you owe me. He demanded it. Pay me back. Well, this fellow servant fell to his knees 
And he begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. The servant who'd just been forgiven his debt refused to release the debt on just a small amount from his fellow servant. Instead, he went off and he had the man thrown into prison and he put him in prison until he could pay the debt. Now, when the other servant saw this, nan 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 tattletales, and I would have too, the people who want justice, and that should be all of us, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and told their master everything that had happened, and then in verse 32, then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, he said, I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants just as I have had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be, not just to be imprisoned, but to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed, which was an unpayable debt. Verse 35, Jesus says this, this, Peter, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. The point here of Jesus's parable, the point here of this context of genuine love is that Jesus wants Peter, he wants us to realize that the debt in which all of us have, our sin debt, is incalculable. I couldn't say it for service, I can't say it now. It's so impossible to be repaid. It's impossible. We, we cannot, by being good, by be trying harder, by praying more, um, we cannot ease, take away our sin debt. We never could. And so what does God do? God showers us with grace. God gives his son, Jesus, who is murdered horrifically on our behalf, even while we were still sinning against him and still would sin against him in the future, he died for us. His blood was shed for us. And so with that, with that, we ask and we go back to the context of genuine love and the point of that parable is when we realize just how much we've been forgiven, it's pretty easy to forgive. And in light of loving genuinely, in light of that one person in your life that is probably coming to your mind right now, and in light of this story, can we not go to the Father and say, Father, I love you. Father, I realize that as difficult as this person is being in my life right now, and my frustration and my anger with them, um, I have wounded you, I have sinned against you a hundred times worse than they have sinned against me. And, and Father, in light of that, I am so grateful for your mercies. I am so grateful for your love. And in my flesh, I do not feel like I can walk in love genuinely with this person. But in light of the truth of your word, in light of the truth of the gospel, which says that in my most needy place, when I was still sinning, you sent your son for me. Yep. Lord, it's, it's pretty easy in light of that. Thank you for that renewal of mind. Um, Lord, I still would like you to remove this pain in the rump from my life. Um, I'd like things to be easier. But in light of the truth, in light of the gospel, um, I, can, I can walk in grace. And I can love through and through even when I feel hurt over and over. I can love without hypocrisy because you loved me genuinely through Christ. And that will give me strength to walk in relationships with those that are hurtful to me. This is the renewal of the mind. This is the gospel of Christ that, that, that does transform our lives that mold us more and more into the image of Christ. It's not easy, but it's the best. It's the best. It's probably not just what that person that's a pain in our rump needs, but it's what our own hearts need in our own lives is that renewal. So we get to do this. We get to choose to act in such a way that is Jesus-centered even when we don't feel like it. That is the most genuine thing we can do at that moment is to is to be reflective upon the love that's been given to us, the forgiveness that's come to us. And then when that debtor is asking for something or being a pain in the rump, we can easily say, no, 
I've been forgiven for so much more. In our own eyes, I don't recommend that you go to that person tomorrow and say, you know what, you are the worst pain in my life, but I now can live with it because um, even as much of a pain as you are to me, I was more of a pain to God. And so I can know what it means to love you genuinely. I don't recommend that. That probably wouldn't go over too well for you. But in your heart, you can be renewed. Maybe, maybe you do need to have that conversation. I don't know. Um, the point here, though, going back before we jump to number two, is genuinely loving through and through, deep down, the love that Paul is talking about here is, is a love that doesn't pretend. It, it's, it's a love that doesn't just smile even though beneath the surface we don't want to believe it or hear it. Um, it, it's a love truly that, that, that starts with repentance. It's, it's a pretending that starts with repenting, I guess maybe be another way to say it. And that's the way it should be because Jesus did not die for the fake you. Um, he actually died for the real you. He was a real Jesus, died for the real you on a real cross, shed his real blood so that we could understand and be revealed to the real him. That's what it looks like to let the dead salmon be exposed in the rottenness of our facade, the rottenness of our heart. We can do this. Number two. Number two. So genuine love um, is this. Um, Our love should be grounded in God's truth. This word is funny, the word abhor. I don't know how many of you just go around saying abhor, but uh, I don't very often, but I'm starting to because it's an awesome word, and I found that there must be some kind of secret society in the whole Google universe that um, wants us not to use the word abhor because the literal translation of abhor is to be horrified by, and every time I typed in abhor, even though I spelled it right, my spell checker would try to change it to abate. I'm like, wait a minute, quit abating me. I'm trying to put in abhor, abhor. Um, so there's something there, not part of the sermon, never mind. So abhor, <laughs> be horrified by what is evil. Be horrified by what is evil and hold fast, or your translation might say cling to that which is good. Love has to be grounded in God's truth because we recognize that if it's not grounded in God's truth, it's ultimately going to be grounded in something, some truth. Um, And our love to be genuine must be grounded in what is godly. It must be grounded in what is true. And the most practical way we, we can see this kind of work its way out and, and what it means to be loving and hating that thing which is evil, abhorring the evilness. Um, we can look at, in, in our society today, uh, especially, I'm just going to use the picture of parenting for a moment because you've all seen this. Um, we have, and a parent, you ask a parent, what do you want for your children? And you say, well, I just want my kids to be happy. Yeah, I mean, I do too. I want my kids to be happy. But what's the definition of happy? Like, how? And the way that is a temptation for parents is, well, that means that every time they cry, every time they ask for something, um, I give them what they want. And the moment they start to to lose it, and I don't want to be that parent in the grocery store with the kid that's ripping the aisles apart, I give them what they want. Well, in reality... In reality, is that what's taking place? Is that the kind of love that we're talking about here? No. I mean, that's not true love. That's, that's actually a sign of, of weak love or it's a sign of lack of love. And so as it relates to being grounded in God's truth and abhorring the things that are evil, as people of God, as Christian people, we are not dumb. We know the things in our own lives, but also the things in other brothers and sisters' lives that are unhealthy, that are carcinogenic, that are deadly to their faith and to their soul. And I'm afraid because of the fear of being maybe labeled a legalist, we never speak up in one another's lives and point out areas in our own lives that maybe, maybe we've embraced something, we've clung to something that is evil. Uh, it can be anything. I mean, anything can be evil in some senses if it becomes an idol, but it, it, can, be a, it can be a show, it can be a series, it can be um, an addiction, anything like this. And, and we as a people, as it relates to us loving genuinely and abhorring, being horrified by the evil around us, are so scared to say, 
um, the right word or the truthful word. And, and my wife will tell you, at least she would have before today, and my wife would tell you that my primary spiritual gift, and when I keep filtering in spiritual gifts, isn't teaching and preaching, it's, it's mercy. And with mercy, with that gift, I have this choice ultimately. I can walk in that gift. I can either walk in that gift in my flesh, my own strength, or I can walk in that gift in the spirit. And so as a merciful person, kind of as my primary spiritual gift, um, I know that I'm walking in my flesh if I sense I need to bring a word of correction or exhortation in a loving way to someone, if I'm avoiding that because I don't want to hurt their feelings. I'm a merciful, I can say I'm a merciful guy. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want to say something that they might take wrong. And so what I do in my flesh is I oftentimes just don't say it. And then I'm breaking the commandment in James, which says those of you who know what the right thing to do and don't do it are sinning. So in the, in the excuse of exercising my spiritual gift of mercy, I'm actually sinning because I'm not bringing forth a word of encouragement to somebody or a word of exhortation to somebody specifically. And then on the flip side, those of you maybe with the gift of exhortation, maybe you can walk in your flesh in that gift of exhortation and you just blast out the truth all the time when maybe you should exercise a little bit more mercy. But this is where the church is the church and the kingdom is the kingdom. But we as people need to be the type of people who are able to speak truth into one another's lives because love is grounded in truth. And if everything is always acceptable in all of our lives and we try to avoid being that person, I don't want to be that person that goes around and picks apart other people's lives. I'm not talking about that. That's a misinterpretation of what we're saying. But we do oftentimes know the moment in time when we, we probably should speak up and say something in gentleness and love to someone that God's put in our life to, to move them more into an abhorrent posture of evil rather than uh, a posture of acceptance always of everything. It's very important in this life. And, and, and it's important for us to also just embrace that this is the picture of doing the the best but the hard thing, the hard best thing at times. And an illustration is in the hospital, young, one of my children, I won't use which name they were, broke a bone and having to go into the hospital. And remember going and having the doctor there, the child is pretty much screaming, the doctor wants to set the bone. And then the doctor says, "Um, you need to hold the child. And and, the child jerks away from I'm having a hard time not using names. Jerks away from the doctor and says, Daddy, please, no. Save me. Help me. Um, Daddy, don't let him do it. And the doctor says, here's a blanket. Wrap him up. Wrap her up. And, and hold her tight. <laughs> wrap him up. Hold him tight. And so wrap it up and hold it tight. And, and I remember they're crying. Um, I'm crying. I'm feeling like a horrible person, a horrible dad, a failure. How could I be doing this? Doctor sets the bone. And two hours later, we're getting a blizzard at Dairy Queen and everything's fine. But at the moment, I'm, I'm feeling like the worst person alive. And for us as the body of Christ, and really the point here is we have to be able to speak into one another's lives in an honorable way, in a loving way, not a judgmental way, not a targeted way, but just a caring way. These are some things that need to be addressed. And I'll tell you, I'm thankful there are those in my life that do that. Every so often, someone comes to the church, they're visiting, or, and I get these, these emails, and they pick apart. They don't even know me, but they have mean, thing, and I'm, mean things to say. I, I have no problem not even reading those. Um, but when it comes from a brother or sister in Christ that I know that loves me, if I don't listen to you, that's on me. And the same thing for us. Um, we can't turn our our family into our enemies. Our family is our family, even if they're not perfect. Thirdly and finally, and this one's the funnest for me, I think, just in the wording of it, is love should be like a family. Love should be like a family. And it says there in verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Now, this this is very interesting, these these two words. Um, This word is, the word is squished together. It's philo storage, philo storage, philo storage. Phileo is the word for love. It's where the, the city, Philadelphia, um, city of brotherly love. Yes, that's a Greek word for brotherly love. The word storage is the word affection. So to actually do an accurate reading in literal translation of Greek, it would say love one another with a love love. 
love one another with a love love, but that love love is a brotherly, affectionate love. Love one another with a love love. I just, I think that's cool. It's just a fun way to say it. And, and this is the struggle for me, personally. When we say we should love like a family, I recognize and realize that so many of us came from really jacked up families where maybe in our families we, we, we had parents or family members that were, were um, by Christian, by title Christian or took us to church. And in some levels we're grateful for that upbringing, but what we saw in between the walls of our home was not reflective of all of, of the loving heart of God the Father. And so when we talk about the family and when we say that love should feel like a family, we need to love one another with a love love, with a brotherly affection. When we see this, when we have this, um, so many of us, our minds go to the, the picture of family that, that is not the picture that Scripture speaks of here. This is the, the family as God has created the family to be, the body of Christ. And in a healthy family... In the healthy family, if someone develops some kind of a sickness or some kind of a problem, you don't just give up on them. You don't just, just you, you may have to put some things in place that are the most beneficial things for them. And especially those of you who, who walk with family members, um, and, I, and I, my heart goes out to you, um, those who walk through family members through really difficult transitions from, from living independently to living in care facilities or coming and bringing in, into your home, those are very, very difficult, some of the most difficult things that you can go through. And as you walk through those times, um, that is a time where, where more than ever you need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and you need the the the, the goodness of what true family looks like. But a healthy family, we, we have to sometimes do the hard things to take care of our family members, but it's the right things to do. And in the other sense, um, we don't just say, hey, you, you, you take care of it yourself. You're on your own. That's not, that's not the picture here. It's a, it's a healthy picture of a family. It's, it's love, love. We are devoted to one another even amidst our faults. And if we keep it in the context of the church, which is what the context of our passage is, this is really even more important. As we talked about last week, so many of us in our, in our humanity can see the church as um, the stomach of Christ, not the body of Christ. I already harped on that last week and earlier. Uh, but what is our view of ecclesiology? What is our view of the church? Is this, is this place um, an event that you visit? Or is this a living, moving, active, God-centered, Jesus-loving organism that wants to see the, the, the gospel of Christ explode in Yakult and around this county and around the world? Because it, it is that, but is it that? It's not ever going to be that if, if it's left up to just a few and there's a lot that aren't engaged, a lot that don't know their gifts and walk in their gifts and practice their gifts imperfectly, which is absolutely okay. We are the family of God. And we can't treat the family of God like it's um, the seasonal, intramural, Sasquatch softball team, which is fantastic, by the way. We missed it this last year. Um, and I, I love our softball team, but it's seasonal. And, you know, if it, sometimes people don't show up and it's just, okay, you know, you still go and have fun. But church isn't like um, an intramural sport. And church isn't like um, some concept of a, a, uh, a free sign up for a week where we kind of come and go and we engage and disengage. No, the church is the church. And when I'm not functioning in a healthy way, you're affected. And when you're not functioning as the church, I'm affected. And the people next to you are affected. We are the church. We are the church. We are the family. And, and we get this opportunity as a family to love as a family, even in the midst of our difficulties even in the midst of um, the struggles with COVID and masks. And I just thank you very much for your graciousness with that process. Um, as, as a family, we've walked through this and you've walked through that with much grace. And that's awesome. Okay. I just realized that in first service, I had to cut out a whole bunch of stuff because we had the membership class in between services. But... I can go back and review all of these, these things that I had to skip in first service. I won't do that. But this, this I will do. This I will do. We, um, we, 
Not me, not the leaders. We are the body of Christ. We are on the equal playing field because of the standard of faith, which is Jesus Christ. And within that, we have to know what it means to walk in and to love through and through. Not with hypocrisy, but to love through and through, to love deep down. Um, and as we do that, we, we also are able to speak one unto another. We're able to... Um, we're able to exercise out the sin in our life through confession. That's one of the beautiful things about church, church, just the life of our church, is that we get to come together, be um, all as one submitted to one another, to God's word, submitted to the fellowship of the saints, worship and, and, and singing. We get an opportunity to take communion together. It's a constant process of Romans 12, 2, a renewing of the mind, reminding ourselves who we are in Christ. And as we do that, as we grow God's kingdom, in that we work alongside one another and alongside of him to accomplish his purposes. And his purposes are far greater than just like building a new church building over there, which will happen this year. Uh, but it's so much greater than that. It's about people. It's about souls. It's about eternity. Uh, it's about unreached people. It's about lost people coming to know the love that we have received through Jesus Christ. How are you engaged in that? How is your love being genuinely used because you know what your spiritual gift is and you're looking for ways to exercise it? Please don't go this week without wrestling with that question a lot. Uh, it's not something I feel comfortable just going on, going by, uh, because this is when the Christian life really takes flight is when we operate in our gifts and that if the Christian takes flight, that's when the church is where it's supposed to be. Let's stand as we close in prayer. I'll have uh, Noah and Beth come and lead us in a, a final exhortation. Father, we just thank you for, for um, your church. Lord, this is your church of which we all are of an equal part. Lord, we confess the different ways in which we, when we do know our spiritual gifts, we operate in the flesh. And when we don't know our spiritual gifts, we, we also just um, leave it up to others. Um, put that conviction upon our heart, not from anything that I would say, but from the working of your Holy Spirit. And uh, Lord, we just pray for a, a um, massive explosion of changed lives because of um, absolute commitment and, and complete um, abandonment and repentance towards um, your son, Jesus Christ, who paid it all for us. And we're thankful for that. And in light of that, we can live in a freedom that can't be offered anywhere else. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world's thy hands at me. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the tree. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that 
God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God. my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. All right, so that concludes our service for today. Uh, go out, have a great week. We'll see you guys again next Sunday.